Now, Beth Heller, Vice President of Programs at the Zoological Society of Milwaukee, will introduce our speaker. Thank you, President Todd, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, I feel like I don't even need to be here because uh, everybody in this room probably is at least somewhat familiar with John Gerda. I've known him for 22 years, and I'm absolutely delighted to be introducing the Milwaukee historian. That is what John Gerda's name is synonymous with now. And I know we want to hear from him, so I'm going to make this nice and quick. Um, instead of doing a traditional bio, I thought I'd just do a little bit of trivia. See how well you know our famous John Gerda. So to start, how many books do you think John Gerda has written? Shout it out if you think you got an answer. All right, good. 22 books, soon to be 23 this fall. Second trivia question. Uh, we did hear uh, a little bit about um, Maya talking about having a major in history. Um, you might guess that as an author, John, uh, his undergraduate's in English. Um, but do you know what his master's degree is in? It's from UWM. Anyone know? It's not history. Cultural geography. Hmm, interesting. All right. And then finally, the last uh, trivia question. In 2006, um, there's a documentary made based on his book, The Making of Milwaukee. It was narrated by John and won an award. What award did this documentary win? It was an Emmy. It was an Emmy Award for Outstanding Achievement for Documentary Programs, Documentary of Historic Significance. So please join me in welcoming John Gerda, author, Milwaukee historian, and award-winning cultural geographer to the stage. Thank you, Beth. And uh, we'd known each other for at least more than 20 years, and she was my son's boss when they were interns at the Urban Ecology Center. So I look at her as just authority figure. <laughs> they, all, they all remember you finally. Uh, it's nice to be back. It's been a while. Uh, so we crawl off under our rocks when COVID eases a little bit. Uh, and I, I know uh, I've been here numerous times before, but you know you're aging when the president is the son of a president you talked under as well. So Tom was back here and now Todd's here. What I recall about Tom is I think I was pushing the, the time limit a little bit that he sort of crept up behind me, you know, right here and kind of said, 20 minutes. <laughs> so so I, I'll try not to uh, abuse the time today. Uh, it is spring, regardless of uh, that snow on the rooftops and lawns yesterday. And Despite the fact the weather has not been cooperative, the first warblers are now in the woods, the first wildflowers are coming up in the woods, you know, so the season is upon us. And as the season uh, gets more and more intense, you know, we are, our thoughts turn to, to open space, to green space, to parks. And that's what I'm talking about today. The story of green space in the Milwaukee area. And Milwaukee has a lot of it, uh, both formal and informal. And my hope is to kind of review the story of our parks and also to kind of be a little bit motivating. Rotary has a, a proud record as a green organization from the Arboretum up along the Milwaukee River to the things you're doing in Lakeshore State Park. So I think that my hope is that uh, kind of knowing the story uh, a little bit better kind of gives you some context for your continuing efforts and maybe you know, kind of inspires you to use your influence to, uh, to write what has been, as, as you know, and as you'll see, a somewhat difficult path for Milwaukee's parks in recent decades. So we've got three screens here, and the first and most obvious fact about the history of our green spaces is that in the beginning, uh, before Europeans began to arrive here, Milwaukee was one big park. You know, we were a wilderness. And most of what's now Milwaukee County was covered with this mesic hardwood forest, maples and red oaks and basswoods. This is Seminary Woods down in Bayview and St. Francis. But this is what most of Milwaukee looked like from essentially shore to shore. But there were large areas of wetland as well. Uh, this is the Horicon Marsh, but this is much like the, 
Menominee Valley and the adjacent areas of the Third Ward, Walker's Point, and much of downtown uh, would have looked like as well in the years before white settlement. So we had abundant wetland. There's one school of thought that says Milwaukee means wetland in the, the Algonquian languages. But there were also uh, little dots of prairie out in the southwest portion of Milwaukee County and what's now Franklin. There, there are still some surviving prairie remnants uh, out in Franklin. And you have big blue stem compass plant and prairie docks. So the things that we restore today, the things that we replant today, the things we try to bring back, that was the story of Milwaukee. It was, it was all native plants and there were no invasives until we invaders came and brought them with us. So this pristine landscape began to change uh, radically and rapidly as soon as people began to arrive uh, in the 1830s. Year by year and acre by acre, our ancestors cut down the trees, they filled in the wetlands, they plowed up the prairies. And on one level, you can describe the history of Milwaukee or of any city as a progressive destruction of natural habitats and their replacement by introduced species, including us. That's pretty much the story of urban life around the entire world. And it's self-evident that cities and wilderness do not mix. It's in our nature to mold the landscapes to our own will, to shape it to meet our own needs and desires. And that's not just people who came from Europe. That was true of the Native Americans who were here after the last brick glacier left some 10,000 years ago. They crisscrossed this territory with trails. What's now Green Bay Avenue was the Green Bay Trail going up to Green Bay. And that was worn two to three feet deep in places you know, by, by millennia of foot traffic you know, going from here up to the Fox Valley. And they also used fire to keep the land open. So this was all you know, a lot of open areas, a lot of savannas in the Milwaukee area and the rest of Wisconsin. And they cleared land around their villages for corn ground. You know, so corn, beans, pumpkin, squash, you know, those were the, the crops that they depended on. And there were large areas, one big one down around Forest Home Cemetery covered nearly a half a square mile of, of corn ground. So you have, you know, the fire is suppressed when people arrive to build a city here. And there are naturalists who will tell you uh, that the major influence on our landscape in the last 150 years is fire suppression. You know, for, for millennia, fire was a tool they used and certainly something that had a huge impact on the vegetation. But European changes were of a different order of magnitude. The old plant communities were not so much altered as they were erased. In their place came wheat fields and pastures and block after block of human habitations. But even as a city grew here in Milwaukee, a native hunger persisted for contact with nature, for green space. It's something, it's, it's, our, it's our genes, it's in our DNA to have green space around us, to have nature you know, kind of in our midst. And certainly the landscape that they developed here to meet that need was tamer than what they had encountered, uh, but it was, it was natural nonetheless. This was not considered a public responsibility. Green space was not considered something the government was supposed to do. The first parks in Milwaukee were these posted stamps of green given by public spirited citizens. And they persist today as Cathedral Square, shown here with the big hat ladies, you know, probably from the 1890s. Walker Square is either Union Square and Clark Square. As the names imply, none of these were larger than a square block. So these were all we had for parks, you know, for the first generation of cityhood. The sole exception was right at the parking lot. So take a look at it when you come out with some, maybe a little different point of view. That was Seventh Ward Park. And as a holdover from the ward rivalries that gave expression to the bridge war back in 1845, wards controlled their own public works budgets, including parks. The Seventh Ward was the east side of downtown, Yankee Hill, that area. So by far the most affluent section of Milwaukee. So they were quite happy to tax themselves because it was for their own benefit to have what was by far the largest park here in Milwaukee beginning back in the 1860s. And we know it today as Juno Park, but this is what Seventh Ward Park looked like uh, back in the later 1800s. And as you can see, a switchback trail is kind of going up and down. Uh, and you can look a little closer there. On the hillside there, our, our ancestor littered as well. So it wasn't just us who were uh, somewhat careless about keeping the landscape kempt. Uh, so you have 
the area develops, and this was certainly the, the show spot in Milwaukee. Look at the lakefront back in the 1890s. It's not there. What you have is railroad tracks. That's the Chicago Northwestern Railroad tracks going down to the depot, a lot of you recall, you know, there on the right-hand side. So to uh, get down to the lake, you had to jump across a very busy railroad track and take your life into your hands. So it was our most important resource today was completely ignored. And this land was purchased by the railroad because it, it was cheap. You know, uh, it was very much at the bottom of the market. So the transformation, if you were to do one of those before and after pictures, uh, here the, back in the 1890s and looking down the southeast today would be pretty remarkable. You know, we, we don't pat ourselves enough on the back about how much we have transformed uh, that lakefront. So you have, uh, despite the fact that there were small areas of green space, back in the early years, this was not considered an urgent need. Christian Wall, Wall Avenue, W-A-H-L, uh, you'll hear about him a little bit later. In 1894, he described the landscape of the east side around North Avenue. He said there was a dense tamarack swamp a little south of Chestnut Street, that's Juno Avenue on the east side. I shot quail on Prospect Avenue, a block or two north of my present residence, right around Lake Park. As people then thought we had parks with a vengeance, for to a man who had to raise corn and pork to feed his family, a tree is looked upon as a mortal enemy, whom to subdue means the hardest kind of labor. So this is something that they, they wanted to transform. They wanted to uh, have trees out of their way. So even though you, know, you, had, you were in a, a natural park here, that need for green space persisted as Milwaukee matured. And where public will was lacking, the private market stepped in. So the green spaces in Milwaukee were very largely a private enterprise, and that was especially picnic groves and beer gardens. And they were just thronged on summer weekends. This is the Pabst Whitefish Bay Resort, and these were largely uh, German institutions, and they observed what they called the Continental Sunday. And so you go to church in the morning, but then you spend the rest of the day with your family in a beer garden. It drove the Yankees nuts. You know, the, the Protestants were going to church once, twice, three times a day. And to have the, the Germans, what the Yankees described as orgies, a Sabbath profanation, you know, was another charge. You know, it was something that uh, really you know, rankled them no end. So that did not deter the Germans from enjoying themselves on a Sunday. And you have some private institutions like Pabst had two beer gardens. He had one in Whitefish Bay and one on what's now King Drive and North Avenue, uh, Burleigh rather. It was Garfield Park and it was Rose Park. Uh, now, now it is Rose Park as well. Uh, so that was uh, an in-town beer garden and they had, among other things, in the back of the, the frontispiece here, they had a, uh, an amusement park with rides like Katzenjammer Castle, kind of a fun ride back. And, what's now a very, very urban neighborhood. They also had that Pabst Whitefish Bay Resort uh, along the lake, obviously, around Henry Clay. And uh, they might take a steamer from downtown called the Bloomer Girl and take these switchback trails up to the top of the hill. And they had planked whitefish dinners were their specialty with whitefish caught in Whitefish Bay. So that was the source of food for a lot of people. And you can just see on the right-hand side of this photograph uh, one of the first uh, Ferris wheels in Milwaukee. Not much, but it was uh, 1890 vintage. No, this, this was something. This was uh, a noteworthy attraction to the Pabst Whitefish Bay Resort. You also had the, the largest of the beer gardens in Milwaukee was the Schlitz Park Beer Garden, which was right around 8th and Brown, just a uh, little bit uh, not too far from the King Drive Business, business District today. And among other things, uh, they had a 5,000-seat amphitheater that was very popular among both labor and socialist groups, often the beginning and ending points of parades that marched around the entire area of Milwaukee, an observation tower from which you could see Lake Michigan, some of the city's very first electric lights back in the 1890s, and entertainment that ranged over the years from light opera to diving horses. So they'd somehow haul a horse up to this platform and you'd jump into a tank with a rider. So it was pretty much a daredevil experience. But that was kind of the range of entertainment that was on offer uh, at, at Schlitz Park. 
So that became, after Prohibition, pretty much killed the beer gardens. That became Lapham Park, then Carver Park, and is now Beckham Park. Uh, so still very much a, an important area of green space in the heart of Milwaukee's north side. And you had Blatt's, which was at one time the fourth largest brewer in Milwaukee. Uh, they had their own beer garden on the Milwaukee River, uh, near a bit north of Locust. Now it's called Pleasant Valley Park. Uh, undeveloped, you know, pretty quiet. I uh, go down there and see no, see nobody, uh, but you can just see the on the sort of the left side of this photograph or this this postcard. Uh, they had a, a boathouse, you know, on the shoreline and all kinds of buildings inside as well. Their, their foundations are still uh, to some degree there if you're looking closely. So you have all these uh, amusements, uh, especially on the Milwaukee River. And Blast was not the only beer garden there, not the only place of recreation. Uh, back in the 1890s, this was Milwaukee's in town up north. This was the center of recreation, and again, it was largely private. So there were, wasn't much in the way of public parks. There were swimming schools just above the North Avenue Dam, and this is Rhone's. You had Whitakers and Becksteins on the far side, and look how they taught these kids to swim. You no, know, they put a kind of a brace underneath them and. Somebody with a good hand kind of, kind of hold them just suspended enough you know, so they wouldn't go under and be scared to death, but also not get too much support. Uh, so like, almost like dangling like bait you know, out there on the Milwaukee River. Uh, and these, these were all Germans. You, know, you, you can almost hear these guys saying, Eins, zwei, Eins, zwei, Eins, zwei, so, as they tried to get their strokes down. So the river was really important. Back in those days, Lake Michigan was considered too rough and too cold. You know, that was not a place of recreation. Uh, the river was because it's warm, it's accessible, and it's in the middle of everything. So the river really was a very big deal. There were public beaches uh, at Gordon Park, uh, just south of the Locust Street Bridge, and above the North Ave around uh, Estabrook as well. There were all kinds of attractions. Uh, this is one just, uh, just south of the North Avenue Bridge on the east side of the river. It's called Shoot the Shoots. It was a water toboggan that opened July 4th, 1896. And it would go down by gravity and splash all the way across to the West Bank. Then they kind of winch it back. People would walk up and they kind of winch the cars back up. This was Wisconsin's first water park. You know, before Wisconsin Dells was in the business, <laughs> the whole Milwaukee River was the equivalent of a water park for our ancestors. And by the mid-1870s, you could take a steam launch from the Wisconsin Avenue Bridge, come up to the North Avenue Dam, which goes back to 1843, and transfer, almost like transferring a bus, and got on to essentially a water taxi that would have dropped you off at any of the amusement parks, beer gardens, canoe clubs, other, other attractions along the upper river, including what was called Coney Island, that was now Hubbard Park uh, in Shorewood. So there really was an awful lot to see. And the fare for that steamer was 15 cents, about three bucks today. I'd do that. You know, I, I, I'm not a nostalgic person, but if there were one place I could go and the distant past in Milwaukee, it would be on a hot summer day on the upper Milwaukee River. You know, that really was a, a very special uh, resource for our ancestors. So you have not just the masses recreation, but you had private homes built by some of Milwaukee's most prominent families, the Kearns, Pulikers, uh, Meineke's, Elines, Elines. This is the Kern Estate on the west bank of the Milwaukee River, a little bit south of Capitol Drive. And the Kern family would take their kids, and the other families as well, would take their kids out of school. You know, when the school year was over, go up to the summer farm and spend all summer there, and then go back to, to the, the city when school was in session again, never having traveled farther north than Capitol Drive. You know, so this, this was the country, a very idyllic you know, kind of a, an atmosphere for kids to enjoy. And there are a lot of stories from the families. And of course, now the current estate is now Kern Park. You know, it was purchased by uh, the city and it became uh, Kern Park still with us. So even though uh, beer gardens and amusement parks along water were very attractive and necessary during the hot days of the year, uh, they could not satisfy the public's hunger for green space. How hungry were they? This is Forest Home Cemetery down on Milwaukee's south side. In 1888, they counted nearly 8,000 people who came down to Forest Home Cemetery to enjoy the, the grounds there. 8,000 people. 
in Forest Home Cemetery, down there on 27th and Forest Home. They were not there to uh, honor the graves of their departed loved ones. Uh, what drew them there was some of the most painstakingly tended landscape in the entire southeastern Wisconsin area. Uh, an ensemble of native trees, uh, which were preserved, and then increased Lapham, famous increased Lapham, that did some plantings as well. Floral plantings, ponds, fountains, carriage paths, and some monumental examples of the stonecutter's art. So it was really a, a very attractive place to go. But 8,000 people in a cemetery on a Sunday meant that somebody was asleep at the switch. Now, Milwaukee was not meeting its responsibility to provide green space for its residents. So in 1889, it took that long, the city incorporates 1846, it took until 1889 for there to be an official park commission. And in that year, the city, not yet the county, it was the city. The county was, the county was farmland. Well, the, the city was where the, the, the people lived. But they established a park commission and tried to make up for lost time. And it was run by Christian Wall. He was the first president of the city park commission, a German immigrant who was raised in Milwaukee, uh, made his fortune in Chicago as a glue manufacturer, and came back here in retirement to become the guiding light of park development in the later 1800s. He became kind of an upper class Johnny Appleseed, uh, is what he did here in Milwaukee. He lived uh, on Prospect Avenue, kind of in the area right around North Point. And he said, when talking about what he tried to do as head of the Park Commission, he said, we especially endeavor to select such property as had not yet been entirely denuded of timber by the ruthless acts of speedy Western civilization. Within a year or two, that Park Commission had purchased what are still some of the biggest parks in Milwaukee, and back then were just off the charts in terms of uh, what the, the size of parkland for Milwaukee that they uh, succeeded. We know those parks today as Lake, Riverside, Washington, Mitchell, Kostriuszko, and Humboldt. So very prominent parks today, but those were the first six. Before they bought those, before the Park Commission bought those back in 1890 and 1891, Milwaukee's public parks, and that is all of Milwaukee's public parks, covered 125 acres. 125 acres, about the size of Estabrook today. You know, so again, really, somebody really was asleep at the switch. So you have park development begins to move forward at a, at a clip, and Milwaukee decides to hire the most prominent landscape architect in America. This is Frederick Law Olmsted. Uh, he would have been 200 this year. He didn't make it, but he would have been. This, this is the bicentennial uh, of his birth. And they hired his firm back in 1892, and to the charter was to design Lake Washington and do some plans for Riverside as well. And our native frugality show through, shown through when they hired him back in 1892. Uh, the Park Commission, led by Wall, explained that the firm was already in Chicago working on the World's Fair, the 1893 Columbia Exposition. Uh, so, as, as they said, uh, the firm enabled them to offer more liberal terms than would have been the case had they not had work in the West. So we got a deal because because they were in the neighborhood. Uh, so you have uh, Olmsted's plans you know, played a critical role in the development of those first six parks. And uh, Lake Park was kind of the Cadillac of, of that fleet of early parks. And the people who ran that park commission, they were hands-on park lovers, including Christian Wall. Uh, he personally supervised the greening of Lake Park. He lived in a mansion, as I said, on Prospect Avenue. It was in that park virtually every day. And crews working under his direction, I mean, he's there, kind of pointing out where to put that tree, where to put that shrub. Uh, they planted, by his own rough estimate, uh, thousands of forest and nursery trees and tens of thousands of shrubs. And some of those trees were specimens, you know, these towering trees that they would go out in the country. And they'd dig the, the root ball uh, in the summertime and wait till wintertime. You know, then they kind of wrap it and kind of take it by sled, you know, horse drawn, then take it by sled to the, the hole finally. And after each one of those big trees had been placed safely in the ground, uh, Wall raised a glass of champagne. So like the, like the image, you know, this kind of a German, German born plutocrat you know, kind of toasting you know, the success of his planting program. So Milwaukee had turned a corner finally, uh, but all was not well. 
Those first six purchases totaled $800,000, which was a fortune back in 1890, 1891. And city officials who may have approved those first purchases, they were not about to authorize spending on more parks or even improvement of the land they had. So it took 10 or 15 years to move beyond passively held land to develop parkland. So it took a long time just to kind of get out of the blocks. And the job was eventually done. And in time, you had landmarks like the conservatory in, in Mitchell Park. This is the predecessor of the domes. It goes back to 1896. That's why the domes are there. They had a floral conservatory before, and it was replaced by the domes back in the mid-1960s. And you have everything from that a conservatory to the golf course in Lake Park. Milwaukee County, in the meantime, was growing and doing some waking up of its own. In 1907, the County Park Commission was established, somewhat some years after the City Park Commission, and their role was to develop green space beyond the city of Milwaukee's borders. Uh, this was a time of tremendous ferment in Milwaukee politics. After years of bossism and graft and corruption, a reform movement gathered speed, and at its head were the socialists. And this is Emil Seidel, who back in 1910 became the first socialist mayor of any major American city and set the tone for the next 50 years. We had Dan Hohen from 1916 to 1940, and then Frank Seidler from 1948 to 1960. So you have the, the key to understanding socialists in Milwaukee is the idea of public enterprise. They were just as enterprising as any private sector organization, but they were enterprising for the public good. And that meant spending money and time on public works, public schools, public libraries, public housing, and public parks. So the city's park development kept on going, and now the counties did as well. And the leader here was this man, Charles B. Whitmell, who was one of the singular figures in Milwaukee's political and certainly in his park history. He was a landscape gardener by profession. He was a planner by instinct and a socialist by conviction. He became the secretary of both the city and the county park commissions. So he was kind of the, the, the guiding light on both those levels. And the park system we have today is very much a product of his vision. In 1923, uh, Charles, here he is. 1923, Charles Whitnell, you know, largely unpaid, uh, in those multiple roles, he unveiled uh, his, his uh, master plan for parks, and he believed uh, devoutly that human beings needed contact with water especially, and he said his principal goal was to save every bit of natural water that had not suffered what may be called civilized vandalism, you know, which is what we did to most of our water courses. And the heart of his plan was a master plan he unveiled back in 1923, and he hung the parks on a trellis of waterways, kind of this double loop around Milwaukee County with large areas, large lagoons, and kind of strategic points uh, along those parkways. He called them parked driveways. So it's like Gallagher talked about, why do we park in the driveway and drive in the parkway? You know, these, these were parked driveways in Whitnell's parlance. And what they, what they did was they created the template for what is today Milwaukee County's park system. So if you do the overlay, of his master plan from 1923 and impose it on the parks of uh, 2022, you, know, uh, you have 99 years later, pretty close, kind of an uncanny resemblance. So he really was kind of the architect of what became Milwaukee's park system. And you still have these parks that are hung on the trellis of the old waterways along the lakefront. Uh, you have Bradford Beach, McKinley Beach, and in 1929, Lincoln Memorial Drive. And you have in Milwaukee more than half of the lakeshore is in the public domain. That's something that uh, is a, a signal fact about Milwaukee. Other areas in the Great Lakes, high volume uh, highways, high end housing in Milwaukee, it's public land for the most part. So we've done a, an exemplary job of preserving of that lakefront for public use. But it's not just the rivers, or not, not just the lake, it's the rivers. Uh, you have public beaches uh, like this one at Clutch Park. And Brown Deer, Lincoln, Esterbrook, Kern, Riverside, and Gordon. Those are the spine of the Milwaukee River Greenway. And you played a critical role in the development of that greenway. Here you have roughly 900 acres, eight miles of shoreline, beginning a mile and a half from City Hall. Who's got that? 
Who's got that the, in the entire country? You know, so we really do have an urban wilderness that, that is unique. And the Arboretum, uh, you put in uh, right there on the East Bank, uh, just south of the Urban Ecology Center, is a critical part uh, of that entire strip of the Greenway. So you should pat yourselves on the back as well. But it wasn't just the Milwaukee. Uh, you have down there on the Knick River, this is the scene from my childhood, crabbing and fishing in the Jackson Park Lagoon. Uh, along the Menominee, you've got the, the Curry, Hoyt, Jacobus, Doyne, Mitchell, now three bridges. And along the KK, Jackson, Pulaski, and Barron. Along the route, uh, you have Greenfield Park, and the biggest of them all, Whitnell Park, covers a square mile, was named for Charles Whitnell while he was still alive. So they knew, they knew kind of the importance of the role he played in Milwaukee's park development. So in every case, these major parks are linked by parkways that offer some of the best urban biking uh, in the country. You know, for those of you who ride on two wheels, they did not materialize overnight. This was not overnight sensation. When Milwaukee County went to work on the master plan of 1923, uh, but in 1929, just six years later, the stock market crashes and you've got kind of a freeze on all kinds of development. Ironically, what had been a catastrophe for the rest of the, the society was a cloud with a silver lining for Milwaukee County's parks. So what happened was you have the New, the New Deal work relief programs uh, beginning back in 1933, WPA, CCC, PWA, uh, a variety of others. And the goal was to put as many guys, especially the women in the WPA, uh, but it was largely guys, put as many people to work as you possibly could on, on manual labor. And what's more manual than park development? And the socialists had just filled shelves with detailed plans for park development. So when the first funds became available back in 1933, they put, they put 4,000 guys to work on two days' notice. You know, so these, these were shovel-ready projects. And this is Estabrook Park. Uh, you can talk about shovel. It was, this was pick and shovel work. So you kind of have a lot of these parks are hand-carved, including ones like, uh, like Lincoln Park up along the upper Milwaukee River. So you have, by the time the Depression ends, Milwaukee's park development was 10 to 15 years ahead of schedule. And that was entirely a result of those, that alphabet soup, uh, very nourishing uh, New Deal work relief programs. So another thing that happened during the Depression was people lost, you know, land was acquired for back taxes. So they, people kind of walked away from their, their subdivisions. And that land reverted to the city, especially on the northwest side. And that resulted finally in roughly 4,300 acres come into, into the city of Milwaukee uh, by 1936. And that becomes, in many cases, parkland. So the Depression, obviously governmental efficiency, was a watchword at a time when people are struggling to put food on the table. So it became obvious that the city and county were redundant in terms of park systems. The city had land outside its limits, and the county had land inside the city. So it made, made no sense whatsoever. So they rationalized that system uh, in a referendum back in 1936. And on January 1st, 1937, all the city parks were folded into the larger county system. Been that way ever since. So there are parks that began as city property, but are now part of that larger county system. No sooner had the depression ended than World War II began. And it provided a respite for people who were the, the privation, the anxiety of war, the parks were a critically important source of kind of a, a, an escape, a refuge, a kind of something beyond you know, kind of the worries about their loved ones and the future of their entire society. And when that war ended, you had a critical housing crisis. You know, people came back, that nobody built anything. The Depression World War II, 15 years, you know, when building was just frozen. So these guys come back from the war and they found, including my dad, they found no place to live. He lived with his parents and farmed my mom out to her, uh, her farmer brother down in Illinois. And that was a very common story. So the county uh, put together these projects where they had temporary housing and where they put the housing was in parks. This is the scene in Wil Wilson Park. You know, these temporary housing <laughs> just covered you know, from end to end you know, the parks with temporary housing. And after the the market kind of caught up, demand caught up with supply, or supply caught up with demand. Uh, a lot of these became uh, lake cottages you know, around southern Wisconsin, and some became firewood. <laughs> these were, these were not, not especially well built uh, in terms of other structures. So finally, uh, you have Milwaukee begins to develop the, the 
areas of today's park system back in the 1950s. And aggressive acquisition swelled the, the holdings to 15,000 acres. Milwaukee has 15,000 acres of green space. That is five times per capita more than the city of Chicago has. You know, so we really do have a remarkable system here. World class in its amenities and its scale as well. Uh, and for a lot of you who grew up here, uh, you know what the amenities were back in the 1960s. And you had out-of-town guests. You took them to the zoo after it moved from Washington Park you know, out there to Blue Mound. You took them to the Mitchell Park Domes, uh, built in stages between 1964 and 1967. Uh, and of course, the lakefront. These were our show places. These were our sources of civic pride and touchstones of our identity as well. Fast forward to the recent past, and you're all aware of what has happened in a time of starvation budgets for the county system. You know, we have a system in crisis with roughly $500 million in deferred maintenance. $500 million in deferred maintenance. So you have places I recall as a kid, this bridge in Whitnall Park, kind of a favorite hiking path. It's closed. And the dam that it kind of held the lagoon together is in tatters. You know, so the, the, the trail is closed simply not because it's unsafe, because, because it got grown over. It was a matter of simple neglect. So what has happened in the very recent past is that for lack of maintenance, our parks have devolved from a state of grace to a state of siege. Crumbling parkways, closed bathrooms, out overgrown vegetation all indicate a system in crisis. And what's going on here, there is no legal necessity for parks as there is for corrections and social services and courts. Those are things that you have to spend tax money in so parks are, to use that word, discretionary. I don't think they're discretionary. I think they are essential. But that legally, they are uh, a matter of discretion. And you have, a number of years ago, back in 2008, a referendum was submitted. The task force I was on kind of came up with it. And we submitted a referendum, the idea for a referendum to the people of Milwaukee County. And a majority of voters voted yes for a one-cent increase in the sales tax to fund park restoration and development. Governor Jim Doyle and the state legislature did not act on that decision and there's been no movement ever since. So we are in a holding pattern. And it's not a holding pattern because it continues to decay. So you have the ongoing uh, decline of the parks. I suspect you being Rotarians, I'm preaching to the choir here, but our generation could blow it. You know, we could lose uh, this legacy. It's been under development for well over a century. Without a surge of new political will, without an infusion of new cash, the park system as we know it will wither into oblivion. In time, our most cherished green spaces, we think of as our birthright, certainly will devolve from untended to unloved and finally unsafe. And what are now corridors of calm will become corridors of crime. That, of course, will be a tragedy of the highest order. Our parks, I sincerely believe, uh, certainly a place for recreation, a place to get out and enjoy yourself. But all of our parks, and here we are you know, at our, the front door of the War Memorial Center here, all of our parks are the most broad and most highly visible embodiment of our commonwealth, what we share as a people. They frame the urban picture for all of us. They provide relief from the insistent pressures of civilization. They open vistas literally to worlds beyond the human and they hint at higher values. Parks are our entire community's front yards and letting them decay would indicate that the owners there are either absent or they are sick. But public parks, I would strongly believe, are something even more. We Milwaukeeans view our parks with an especially strong sense of ownership. Each is a classic declaration of democracy an unmistakable statement that the beauty spots belong to all of us. We need to keep making that statement for our own welfare and the welfare for all the generations still to come.